1 Samuel 13, I'm talking about crossroads of the Christian life. Crossroads of the Christian life. I'll begin by reading the whole chapter of 1 Samuel 13. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and the people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward of Bethaven. And the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in the caves and in thickets and in rocks and in the high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people following him, trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, and he, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about six hundred men. And Saul and Jonathan his son, and the people that were present with him abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped at Michmash. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leadeth to Afra, unto the land of Shual. And the other company turned the way to Beth Horon. And another company turned the way of the border that looketh toward the valley of Zeboim, toward the wilderness. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, and his coulter, and his axe, and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks, and for the coulters, and for the forks, and for the axes, and to sharpen the goads. And it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan his sons was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. I pray, God, that you would just be with the word, Lord. Uh, strengthen me to, to do according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're talking then about the crossroads of the Christian life, the crossroads of the Christian life. Many times you'll find as you as you grow and you've been a Christian for any length of time, some of us in here are, are closer to newborn babes, some of us are a little more seasoned in our Christian walk, but no matter what position you're in, you're always going to come to the next crossroad, the next time when you actually have to decide to go to the right hand or to the left. 
Quite often the outcome of your choice shows whether you are following God or whether you are failing in the area of following God. Either way, we need to recognize that these choices come and our consequences are such, but even after the consequence comes to be, after we've made the decision to go left or right, and then, and then the result of that decision comes upon us, we still have to make the decision whether we are going to press on or whether we are going to relinquish and essentially give up. Some of the times the most important decisions you'll make in the Christian life come at the most challenging of times. And this is why it's important for us to prepare ourselves to make such decisions. Because if we're just going to walk sort of, sort of haphazard and willy-nilly through the Christian life, then when we get to these crossroads, we're going to find that we're often just shooting from the hip. We're often just, just taking a stab in the dark. We're often just, just doing the best that we can, but sometimes we're not very <laughs> wise in our decision making. This is why it's important for us to recognize, because when you're in these challenging times and the big decisions come upon you, there are certain consequences. There are sure consequences to every move and every decision that you make. So let's prepare ourselves now to make the decisions that we'll make in the future. I just wanted to outline about the crossroads of the Christian life, things that I have learned and things that scripturally are taught from people that have made the wrong decision and we can learn from them definitely I want to take from certain don'ts okay there's so many do's do this do that do this do that but we can also learn much from the people that have made wrong decisions and we can learn from the don'ts don't do these things when you come to an important decision especially in a troubling or challenging time in your life and we're all going to face those the next challenge is just one one step away honestly christian life is just one challenge after another after another we have all eternity to be relaxed and content and just just enjoy ourselves without challenges that are facing us but this life is just a series of trials trial after trial challenge after challenge so I want to prepare you a little bit. These are some things that you don't do when you're making important decisions, when you come to a crossroad in the Christian life. The first there from 1 Samuel 13 is don't choose or don't decide which way to go based on our own timing. So don't make a decision based on my perception of when things ought to happen. Because quite often... We have an idea, and you know, we're all about planning, right? We're going to have our two-year plan, our five-year plan, and our ten-year plan. But what we need to understand is our timing isn't always God's timing. I'm not opposed to planning, preparing. Uh, you know, even now I'm setting goals that stretch out as far as next May. But I need to be wise concerning what God is doing in these areas and understand that my perception of certain things and when I believe they should happen isn't always the same as God. So don't choose or don't make your decision based on your own timing. Look at uh, verse 8, 1 Samuel in verse 8, chapter 13 there. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. So Samuel had appointed this particular time in which he would arrive, okay? But this is what I say, even though Samuel had planned, right, it doesn't necessarily mean that it happens at exactly that moment. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from them. Perhaps he'd spread around that this is the set time, this is the planned time. And so everyone had known that this was the particular moment when Samuel was to arrive. And so the decision came, and Saul said in verse 9, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. So the time came, the appointed time came. This is our timing. This is what man had decided was the appointed time. But we know that this was the wrong decision, because in verse 10 it says, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the, an, an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. So I think what actually happened here was Saul got a little excited. He got a little overzealous. He said, hey, the time has come. The seven days has come. And we know that a day is 24 hours. And so when someone says, hey, I'm coming this day, well, that could be bright and early in the morning. That could be much later. 
But we see that if Saul had heard Samuel say, this is the appointed time, this is the day that I'll arrive, he jumped the gun a little bit because Samuel did exactly what he had claimed he was going to do. In that time he arrived. And when Samuel arrived, verse 11 says, Samuel said, what hast thou done? Now Saul here, because he saw that the people were scattered from me, is what he says, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves to Mishmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me and to Gilgal. And there's another statement of his own understanding of the appointed time. Don't use your own timing that you think is appropriate, that you think an event will happen, that you think that this is the moment to guide you in making decisions. Because here he said, surely Samuel delays his coming. I got to do something. Then his statement here to Samuel is that surely the Philistines are going to come upon us at this exact moment. And at this time, I have not made supplication unto the Lord. So the decision that he made there is in verse 12, where he says, I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. This is something that was reserved for the priest, that was reserved for the prophets. This was not the realm of authority that a king had. And yet King Saul finds it appropriate because he made the decision at a crunch time, at a time that he perceived of when things should happen, he made that decision, and it was the wrong decision. As soon as he had made the decision, you got to wonder, you got to think that his perception might have been off, and we ourselves got to think and got to wonder that when we think, oh, this is the day, I have to make this decision now. I have to do such a thing now. This is the moment. Sometimes we might wonder if our perception isn't off. Our perception of what the timing of the Lord is. The timing of an expected thing, an expected opportunity. He began to, in verse 11 and 12, excuse and to point blame. He said, the people have scattered. And uh, certainly the Philistines are going to come upon me. And all these reasons why not to. But regardless, the bottom line is it says in verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. So it's clear that even though the preaching and the proclamation of the appointed time that was given by Samuel was from his mouth, it was the command of God to wait until that time in order that the offering would be done appropriately, decently, and in order. And we got to remember in our own lives that our own timing of things isn't always appropriate. Things got to be decent, and they got to be in order, and they got to be according to God's command. And here I am in the same position where I can jump the gun in a lot of ways, overstep my authority within this church, and do things my own way, as we've seen many in the past have done. But I need to understand that my own timing of things like ordination, my own timing of things, <clears throat> sorry, like stepping up and, and being appointed as the pastor has to come in an order that is decent and acceptable and follows the commands of God. And here Saul disobeyed. Not only did he jump the gun, but he did things out of order and wrong in the sight of God. So we need to not choose or make decisions based on our own perception of things, but we need to be willing to wait. Willing to wait. Willing to wait, yes, even a little bit longer. And I know sometimes when it comes decision time, waiting a little bit longer is a struggle. It is difficult for us. We get impatient, and like Saul, we tend to jump the gun. But you notice that as soon as he jumped the gun, the moment came. And so we're often just one moment away from making the right decision and find things come exactly as God had appointed in his own timing and in his own order. So be willing to wait, Christian. When it comes to a crossroad in your life, when you need to choose to go left or to go right, when you need to choose yes or no, when you need to make those decisions, be willing to wait. Don't jump the gun. Don't just take those steps out of panic. We definitely need to make sure, because quite often these crossroads come with this, that we are watchful and we are waiting in the times of trouble, in the times 
of fear in the times of trembling. Even as Saul had experienced when he brought people away with him, they were in trembling, let alone all the others of Israel who had found themselves in such a strait that they were hiding in caves and thickets and rocks and every place that they possibly could hide. He had found himself then absorbing some of that fear and some of that worry. Best thing that Saul could have done was just ignore the chaos around him, ignore the fear and trembling around him, and just simply wait for things to be done in the appointed time, which Samuel had promised, and then do things according to the Word of God. The next one I want to look at is in Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. Way back in Genesis chapter 13 at the beginning of your Bible... We just talked about not choosing or deciding things based on our own timing. We need to be ready and prepared to wait at crossroads. Wait for the opportunity that God just opens the door wide open. It's much easier when God shows you the way. The next thing is don't choose, don't decide based on carnal things. Or based on your perception of where God's blessing would be. In Genesis chapter 13, we'll begin in verse 1, it says, And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had and lot with him un into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lift up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from another. So don't choose based on carnal things. Don't choose based on carnal things. There in verse 9, the choice was made to separate. Now to me, the best choice would have been to just avoid the strife and the contention and continue on in the way that they were. But nevertheless, they decided that they would separate as to avoid the contention and the straight, narrow way that they had, the place that they had to keep both types of cattle. And the strife was such that they decided to separate. They decided to spread out. Now the first thing that Lot did in verse 10 takes me all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It says, and Lot lifted up his eyes. And isn't it such that when it comes to carnal things, when it comes to earthly things, the first thing that we do is see with our eyes and then react based upon that. Didn't Eve say that she, didn't Eve see with her eyes that the tree was good for food and one desired to make one? She looked upon it and that was the motivating factor that drove her to commit that sin against God by eating of the forbidden tree. Here Lot does the same thing. He lifts up his eyes and then gives this great review of what he sees. He beheld the plain of Jordan. He saw it was well watered, even as the, the Lord uh, had left Sodom and Gomorrah before it was destroyed. It is as the garden of the Lord. It's even as Eden, he says. And as the land of Egypt, as thou comest into Zor. A beautiful, well watered, furnished land. And he saw that it was that way. He saw it was well watered. He saw it was as the garden of Eden. He saw it was like unto Egypt. Now the interesting thing about this decision that he made was why was he referencing Egypt at this time? Well, it was because this is where he immediately had come from. 
Lot here based his decision upon what he saw with his eyes. The carnal motivation of his own fleshly desires as he looked upon the land and made that choice. But Abram was just as guilty. Look back in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10. It says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land, and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see it, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, and they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me. So here, the first decision that Abram made was to go based on a carnal thing. He saw the famine. He saw that it was sore in the land. So we need to be careful then, the lessons that we're learning here, in times of contention. This is what Lot experienced, a contentious time. And he made the decision with his eyes to follow after carnal things. Abram, in the same context, he was noticing famine. So we need to be careful in times of famine, times of want, times of lacking. He made the decision to go back to Egypt, to step away from and backslide from the promise of God to be in a particular era and go unto Egypt. We know that in chapter 13 and verse 4, there, that Abraham said, unto the place of the altar which he had made, there at the first, there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. So Abram essentially had to come full circle after making the wrong decision, first out of fear of suffering in the famine, he went and he made the decision to go to Egypt. Then he also made the decision based upon looking on his wife, seeing her fair and the fear overwhelming him were that he had her lie to the Egyptians. We need to be willing, unlike these two men in this, in this immediate context, to walk by faith and not by sight. Our eyesight, our vision, our, our, our looking upon carnal things, things of this world, will always trip us up if we base our decisions upon what we see. We need to decide based on faith that is before us rather than the sight of the situation before us. Both of these men chose, again, to do contrary to the command of God and the promise that he had made. They were together in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 6 where it says, And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Mori, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Abram had heard this revelation from God, the promise that the land where the Canaanite dwelt was the promised land. And Lot would have been there when that same promise was made. And yet both of them, first Abraham making the decision to go into Egypt, then afterwards Lot making the decision to go into the well-watered plains of Sodom, both of them had failed in the area of faith because they chose carnal things and at the time when they had a decision to make whether to go left or whether to go right, whether to say yes or whether to say no, whether to obey God or whether to not obey God, they chose based on what they saw and we need to be willing to walk by faith and not by sight. It's faith that leads the Christian life. When we come to a crossroads, it's faith that needs to be the deciding factor about what we decide. Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> the next thing that we're going to look at in Luke chapter 22 is don't choose or don't make your decisions when you get to a crossroads and you're deciding whether to go left or whether to go right. Don't choose based on pleasing men. We need to make our decision at those times based upon pleasing God. And in Luke chapter 22, in verse 1, it says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Okay? Here the chief priests are reacting out of fear of men. They want to please the men that are surrounding them, and therefore they're seeking to 
kill Jesus, but for fear they want to do it in such a way. They need to seek a way. They need to see that they, they sought out a particular way of doing this. Verse 3 says, then entered Satan. Okay, this is a great opportunity for Satan now to work because he's wily, because he's subtle, right? Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him in the absence of the multitude. So here again, we have a group that is seeking out ways to subtly destroy Jesus because they are fearing the people. Their decision is one that would allow them to still please men. They're not pleasing unto God. And even so, Satan enters into Judas and he then makes the decision not to follow after Satan. It's interesting, it says he went his way. And when he goes his way, it's to commune with these same that are desired out of fear of men to do things subtly, do things their own way. They covenant, and over money, both of them walk away happy. Both of them walk away pleased. The high priest sought an opportunity to betray Jesus, and Judas had that at his disposal. Judas was happy to receive money. And in the same way, both were pleasing men. And both were glad as they walked away. Look over in verse 47. And in verse 47 it says, And while he yet spake, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man? With a kiss. We see that Judas's motivation was not to please God, was not to please the Son of God. He would rather please men. He would rather please himself. And so his decision followed that same line of reason. And as Christians, we need to be careful in this area and not be always trying to please the next man in our life. Always not be trying to please the next woman in our life. Always not trying to get along, go along to get along in order that we could have a peaceful walk and be at peace with all men. In as much as in us is, we should, but we need to recognize and be careful that there are some times in the Christian life, especially when we come to a crossroad, that Christ is dealing with us in particular and trying us. He's trying to determine whether or not we will stand with him or not with him. And so when we get to those crossroads where we're deciding, do we please men or do we please God? The decision should be clear. We should always seek to please God. We know that right before Judas went and betrayed, he said, uh, this statement was made in the Bible, this is in verse 45, and when he rose up from prayer, this is Jesus, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Go to John chapter 13. Jesus was concerned that not, not only Judas, who he had said, go and do what thou will, he was concerned that his own disciples would make the decision, would be tempted to make decisions in order to please men and not please God in their lives. We need to be careful to recognize the times when Christ is asking us to stand, when he is trying us, when he is trying to motivate us to choose the right. These are the crossroads, Christian. These are the opportunities that we have to make the right decision. Always, always, always please God at these times. Don't seek to please men. In John chapter 13 and verse 27, it says, And after the sop, Satan entered into them, into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. And we know that after that, that was the moment that Judas went and he followed his own way and he covenanted with the men that were going to destroy Jesus. He betrayed him at this time. There, the decision was made. He had chose the wrong. We need to learn that it's not time to please self. It's not time to please other men when we get to the crossroad, when we get to a point where we're deciding left or right, obey God, obey men. We need to recognize that we need to choose the right. And Judas here chose wrong, learned from his mistake. But Peter, a certain disciple, still had the opportunity to make a decision. In verse 36, it says, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, 
Whither goest thou? Jesus answered, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So Peter here makes this bold proclamation of his desire to follow Jesus. And in John chapter 18, we see it play out. He says, Jesus, where are you going? I will follow you wherever. I will lay down my life for you. Certainly he was resolved in advance to make the right decision, even as I'm charging each and every one of you here today to be resolved to make the right decision. When you get to the crossroads, don't make your own timing for things. Don't choose based on your perception of when things should happen, but rather be willing to wait. When you come to the crossroads, don't choose based on carnal things. Be willing to walk by faith and not by sight of the things that are before you. When you come to the crossroads, as Peter had done, and as he had sworn in an oath that he would fulfill, don't choose based on pleasing men, but choose based on pleasing God above all things. John chapter 18 and verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the place of the high priest. So here Simon is following Jesus. Aren't we all following Jesus today? Haven't we all resolved in our heart that we're going to seek after him? We're going to follow him to the bitter end. We're going to follow him to the death. He continues in verse 16 and says, But Peter stood at the door without. You notice he was following him just as much, but there was a window there. There was a gap there. He wasn't fully on board. He wasn't fully engaged with following the Lord. He stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. What a great thing that his, his brother would notice he's standing without. Encourage him unto the Lord. Get involved. Get in close. Then saith the damsel that kept the door. So here's the challenge that Peter had before him. He stood without. He was invited into the presence of God. He's going to choose now. Is he going to please men or is he going to please God? The damsel says this. Art thou not also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. In verse 18, And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Peter here makes his first denial of Christ. And he stands at the door without, almost putting a little bit of a space between him and the Lord. His brother invites him, come closer, come be with the Savior, come be close to Jesus. And as he comes in, the first decision of his, of his proclamation, the first opportunity he had to succeed in the area that he had committed himself to, was when a little maid asked him, aren't you one of the disciples? And he said, I am not. And then proceeded to warm himself among the world. Considered to, proceeded to gather amongst the men that were there. Verse 19, And the high priest asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I speak openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. When he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I had spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? And Ananias had sent him, bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. Here's Simon again. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Still standing with the world, still amongst men, pleasing men. Then said, therefore unto him, art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it, said, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. We need to be willing to stand with Jesus. We can't just be on the fence, as we talked about earlier. We don't need to be pleasing men and pleasing God, or pleasing men would be the greater sin. 
But we need to be always, when we get to these life decisions, these opportunities to choose left or choose right, choose pleasing God or pleasing men, we always have to please God. And pleasing God comes with standing with Jesus. If we stand with Jesus, that's the faith position. That's the position that is trod by so few. That's the position of great danger, great worry, great trouble. But that's the decision that Christians need to make most often. Peter here, even as Judas, chose to please men. He chose to sustain self. He chose to gratify self with the safety, with the warmth of communion with the world, of fellowshipping with the world. Not with believers, though somebody had reached out to him and said, come closer to the Savior. John had said, come to the Savior. Peter established himself, settled himself, and was with the world rather than with God's people. He was with the world, pleasing the world rather than pleasing God and being willing to stand with Jesus. And so we see here, many times we come to crossroads in the Christian life. The opportunity is presented before us to choose one thing or another. We make big decisions. We make small decisions. But you'll find that in the most trying times, even little decisions can seem great challenge, great difficulty surrounding them. And there's certain consequences that resolve around those things. So some of the don'ts. Don't choose based on our own timing. Don't get to a point in your life where you have to make a decision and it feels like it's so important, it's got to be done now. But we need to be willing to wait a little bit longer. Don't choose based on carnal things, on what you see before you, on the, on the things that you would perceive as the blessing of God. Rather, be willing to walk by faith and not by sight because your sight quite often deceives you, it tricks you. You see things that you want to see rather than seeing what God wants you to see. The faith position believes God even when we're walking in darkness, right? in the shadow of death. And finally, don't choose. Don't make your decision based upon pleasing men. We always have to be in the business as Christians of pleasing God. What does the Bible say? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We need to be willing to trust by faith to stand with Jesus. Never mind standing with the world. Never mind pleasing our friends, pleasing our family, pleasing the people that we used to chum around with, we used to be buddies with, we used to be friends with. We need to put those things aside, or rather be willing to, in order that we could please the Savior, be willing to stand with Jesus. These are things that we shouldn't do. Before making big decisions, I implore you, First, you need to examine yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 says, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. We are to prove, to try, to put our own hearts through the fire in order to reveal the truth about them. Examine yourself. Take time for inner reflection, to know where you stand before God, to know where you stand in this life. Whether you be in the faith or no. See, the problem is, is that when we don't examine ourselves before making big decisions, too often I have seen this. Too often I have seen great spiritual decisions are made when people are at a spiritual low. Show me the guy that has given up on soul winning. Show me the guy that's showing up late to the church. Show me the guy that leaves as soon as it's done, that doesn't fellowship, that doesn't commune with believers, that doesn't have love for the brethren, and show me the guy that has a decision before him, and I will show you the man that's making the wrong decision. And I've seen it time and time and time and time again, where people that are at spiritual lows are suddenly going to make a big life-changing decision to take a new job. They're going to make a big life-changing position to move. They're going to make a big life-changing decision to, to completely turn their whole world upside down. We need to examine ourselves, prove our own selves, whether we be in the faith. Are we walking by faith? As we come to that time where we're going to be at a crossroad, we're going to go left or we're going to go right, and we're going to decide. Make sure you're right with God at those times. The next thing we need to do before making big decisions is wait, 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 wait. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, 
and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We need to be quick to be patient. That needs to be the first thing that Christians need to do. We come to a decision time. We don't need to be hasty like Saul was and say, okay, the time is coming now. The enemy is upon me. The, the, the appointed time that the preacher would come, the word of God isn't coming to me speedily. I'm not hearing the revelation of the Savior. God, to make a decision. Go, go, go. Most of these decisions that we make at these times of great uh, challenge, these times of great hardship, which also are often accompanied with a time of making a crossroad decision, most of these decisions aren't as urgent as you think. Take some time. Wait on God. Ask Him. Seek Him. Desire that He would show you the step, the path to make. Don't be like Saul who hastily made the decision only to find that the decency and order of God was just steps away. Wait, wait, wait. Most decisions aren't as urgent as you think. The next is read your Bible. Get in your Bible. Study your Bible. Absorb your Bible. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's Word gives light. God's Word shows paths, reveals things unto the believer. The next steps that we need to make, the decisions that we need to make, are going to come from God's words. And it may not speak to one person as it speaks to another. I've had passages of Scripture that are ripped out of their context that speak to me personally to make a decision in a certain way. Now, I wouldn't stand up here and preach that because I understand that this is just biblical revelation, some words hitting me at a certain point at a certain time in order to make a certain decision. That happens all the time, but it's only in a personal relationship, a personal study with the Word of God that those revelations come to you. So read your Bible because you never know in your daily Bible reading, even if you're just trudging through, just trying to get along. Again, don't make those decisions when you're at a weak point spiritually. Wait on God. Allow Him to speak to you. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. And that way He can speak to you. He has the opportunity to you. You're not going to wait there and just hear somebody, Samson, you know, the voice of God come and enter into the room. That's not how God speaks to His people today. If you want God to lighten your path, if you want God to show you what's before you and help you make decisions, this is the only way He's going to speak to you today. God's going to show you the way. He's going to show you the path by His Word. Now, if it's unclear, if you're reading the Bible and you're just like, I don't know what I need to do. I, I, I'm unsure of what I need to do. The time is coming. I don't make the decision. What do you need to do next? If it's unclear... You wait some more. And this is the thing. Christians, we don't need to be hasty to jump in to any type of meaningful, long-lasting decision. We need to wait for God's appointed order, God's appointed time. Give it time. Be patient. Allow God to speak to you through His Word. And if you're still confused, don't jump in. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Some people get annoyed with how much Brother Josh waits and waits and waits. He doesn't jump on things right away. He doesn't, he doesn't decide to make big, hasty decisions often. He, he waits, he waits, he waits, and it seems complacent. It's not. It's just trusting God to show me the way so that I know when he shows me that it was the right decision to make. Isaiah chapter 40, if you would, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. In verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. So we don't need to worry when we're waiting on God. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of everything. He's not getting weary. He's not getting tired. You may be getting tired of waiting for him, but he's coming. He's going to get involved. He's going to move. There is no searching of his understanding. He knows it all. So as I'm going to make a, a rash decision based upon me not knowing much and just worrying in fear, you can see that I've made the wrong decision to just go forward. You, well, you can see how Saul made the wrong decision to, to offer the bullet, to, to offer the peace offering. Right? He was unsure. But God, there is no unsurety in him. There's no searching of his understanding. Verse 29, he giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. 
Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, they that wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is talking about great endurance. Even the youth shall faint. When you see young children, you see young adults and the energy that they have, and you're like, man, I wish I had that type of energy. Well, those that are waiting on the Lord have that and beyond. They have renewing strength. They have wings as eagles to soar. They can run and they will never weary. They can walk and they can never faint because God is giving power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increaseth their strength. He builds them up. And so waiting doesn't have to seem to the Christian to be such a passive Position. Oh, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. Hey, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. It should be something that is of great spiritual significance to wait on God. Because that is where strength comes from. That is where power comes from. When you're exhibiting patience, being patient with God, waiting on Him, looking to Him, waiting for the hand of the Master to move so that you can act. That's a great position to be in. When you're unclear about next steps, just wait. Strengthen yourself a while. When you're unclear about what to do, when you're deciding if you're going to go to the left hand or the right hand, wait. Have renewed strength. Mount as wings of evil. Run, don't be weary. Walk and not faint. Just be with God. And that's the last point. Seek the Lord along the way. When you're making big decisions, you need to examine yourselves, you need to wait, you need to read your Bible. If you're unclear, wait some more, and you need to seek God along the way. That speaks to prayer. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. One more place. Seek the Lord along the way. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected End. So God has an expectation for the end of a matter. He, he, he has something that he has determined. He knows what is coming. He has seen the end from the beginning. Okay, His thoughts toward us are to get us to that end. And as we go, there is peace, not of evil. There is gift and not of sacrifice. God will provide and carry you to that expected end. Verse 12, Then shall ye call upon me, this is prayer, and he shall go and pray unto me. And the response of God isn't just, well, just make a decision. What are you doing? Come on, make your next step. Do what you need to do. No, God says, his response is, I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, in verse 13, and find me, when ye shall search for me with your whole heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And this is what we need to do as Christians when we come to the crossroads of life. We need to be ready to understand that God's thoughts toward us aren't that he would steamroll us through every decision, leave us always in strife and turmoil, leave us confused about the next thing that we have. No, God has peace for you. He will give you direction. And if you pray to him, he will hearken unto you. And what will he do? He'll give you revelation through his word about what is next. And when you don't understand what he is giving to you, don't fret because peace comes and strength comes and more opportunity for growth comes when you simply wait for him and seek him again and seek him again and seek him again. And even as you're making the decision and you finally say, oh God, I believe that this is where you want me to go. You want me to go left. I thought it was going to be a right-hand direction, but maybe that was my eyes seeing something that I liked. Maybe that was me trying to please men if I was to go to the right. Maybe, maybe that was just me thinking that I was out of time and I just had to make some decision. Casting lots, okay, I'm going to go right. God, I've realized now that that was wrong. And you can seek God as you make the decision to do right by going left. And as you do, ask Him, seek Him, pray unto Him. Say, God, I believe this is what you have. I believe this is where you want me to go. Call upon Him, seek Him, and you shall find Him. And when you search with your whole heart, he will be found of you. And this is the decision-making process. Even when you finally make the position where you think God has revealed to you where to go, you're still taking a step of faith, but you're taking a step of calculated faith, if that makes any sense. You're not just shooting from the... Faith isn't just like, 
oh, whatsoever will be, and just, just kind of jumping into everything and just hoping God to clean up the mess afterwards. No, faith is an educated position. Faith is a position where you've seen all that the Bible has revealed to you. You've prayed to God. You've self-examined. You know that your heart is right before Him. You've waited. You've been patient. Now it's time to make a decision. You say, God, what shall I do? And He shows you Bible. God, what shall I do? And He shows you Bible. I'm still waiting, God. I don't understand. And He shows you Bible. And then you find make the decision based upon all the revelation that God has given you to choose to by faith make the right choice okay and when you make the right choice under the circumstance given and you haven't done all the things that are wrong from the examples that we've learned but you've done in the best of your ability and the best of your knowledge and the best of your heart and your desire what God wants for you to do and you've sought him and you're waiting for him and you're seeking him and you're waiting for him and you're ready to make that decision God will bless in that area and even if you mess it up even if you think that oh man I might have made the wrong decision by faith Follow through, persevere, and then what happens? The next crossroad is just up the line where you can make that same decision. Hey, Abraham made wrong decisions, Christian. You're going to make wrong decisions. Do you know what God did? He brought him out of Egypt, out of the sin, out of the world, out of the problem, saved him alive, protected him from the king that was going to destroy him, sent him on his way, and then about 30, 12 verses maybe later, he's back to that same altar. The exact same position where he's now going to make the same decision. And now, hey, he knew he was wrong for going to Egypt. So he's going to decide to go in the right direction where God had for him in the first place. God will give you second chances, okay? But what I'm setting you up for is for the know-how and for the, the uh, revelation of the scriptures to at least do your best when you get to these crossroads to make the right decision. Make the scriptural decision. Make the educated, biblical position uh, <clears throat> decision in order that you would be in a better position for the next decision and the next decision and the next decision. And babes, you're going to mess it up more than some of us that are more seasoned. But the problem with some of us that are more seasoned is once we get there, we get a little cocky. We get a little full of ourselves. We get a little self-righteous. We think that we can do it on our own. And we need to take a step back and we need to fail. The Christian life is a series of decisions. Choose to follow God through it choose to not base it on carnal things but have faith in God and choose to wait upon him for the timing that he has appointed and you'll be making the choice towards righteousness and pleasing God by faith. Father, I thank